you for joining us for another episode of Destination Durham, a TV show that highlights the community spirit of the town of Durham, linking our past, exploring our future. Tonight, we'll be talking about the Coggenshaw Valley Education Foundation, what it does and how it helps different groups and organizations throughout the community. First, let's take a look at CVEF's history. The Coggenshaw Valley Education Foundation has worked to make dreams a reality for members of the Durham and Middlefield community. We want an opportunity to enrich our community in ways that uh, wouldn't be available otherwise, and we'd like to do this for everybody, not just for the schools. The brainchild of Merrill Adams, CVEF, got its start back in 2008 as a way to fund community programs that would bring the community together. And we're looking for ideas that are creative and that haven't been done before that would have a uh, significant impact on any, any of our citizens, school kids as well as adults. Every year, CVEF helps to fund nonprofit organizations and special projects aimed at lifelong learning. Throughout the year, Coggenshock Valley Education Foundation raises money with the help of donors, as well as through fundraisers like the Trivia and Spelling Bees held every year. Thanks, Laura. And joining us tonight is CVEF President Betsy White Booz and Nancy Earls, who's in charge of the grants. Thank you both for joining us tonight and being on Destination Durham and giving us our grant so we can continue to do yeah. programming like this. So thank you very much. So how did CVEF recognize the need for an organization like itself in the community? Well, I think um, uh, largely because of Meryl um, Adams, who was our founder, uh, you know, she is a retired teacher and a member of the Board of Education, and she just has really a, a passion about um, education in the community. Um, and she brought a group of sort of like-minded people together, uh, and we sort of came up with the charge of um, CVEF. The thing that makes us a little different um, actually a lot different from most other education foundations, is that we do have a commitment to lifelong learning in the community, whereas many other education foundations support um, the public school systems. We, you know, we take a look at um, a vast ar array of educational opportunities and enrichment efforts that people would like to pursue and, and try to look at it in a more holistic approach. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Was there a catalyst that brought this to fruition? Was there a specific event or circumstance? Uh, I I don't think a specific circumstance. As I said, there was a there is a state consortium of education foundations mm -hmm. for Connecticut, and um, Merrill on her own got um, sort of tuned into them, and um, they actually helped us a lot. We're a member of the state consortium, and they helped us a lot in terms of. Um, giving us a foundation so we didn't have to re you know reinvent the wheel um, they helped us you know with our structure with our form and that kind of thing and then we took it from there and it has been eight years and um, we've changed a little bit over the years uh, we looked at our focus not to lifelong education but the kinds of things that we concentrate on one of which is and really our foundation mm -hmm. is our grants program that Nancy heads that committee and I think just to add I think Merrill and we all see the communities of Durham and Middlefield as um, opportunities of people who honor learning mm -hmm. uh, our school systems are great um, and our graduates do well and uh, we thought this would be a prime place to to do something like this and it would be welcomed mm -hmm. um, and it has been that's been our experience so far right. and overall how many programs has your organization sponsored well we funded um, about 50 grants and um, totaling about $75,000 uh, um, this we're entering into our eighth grant cycle and then in addition to grants we do have other programs that we run in the community um, such as Talk of the Towns, which I believe we're going to touch a little bit mm -hmm. upon later. And, um, uh, and we also get involved in other community efforts. For example, we participated in Relay for Life last year when mm -hmm. Durham initiated that. So, um, but I think grants are something that we, that, may, that, that we provide that there isn't any other similar organization that offers that opportunity. Now, what was special about the organization that you two wanted to become a part of it? 
Well, I think I'm going to let Nan Nancy is a teacher, so we'll <laughs> we'll let her start. <laughs> um, Meryl approached me. I was not one of the founding um, founding mothers' fathers, um, but Meryl approached me um, and asked if I would be like a liaison to the mm -hmm. schools because I do teach at Strong Middle School, yes. and they needed somebody who would be a liaison to the school system. And I said, you know, I don't know, I'm really, really busy. Um, tell me more about it. And the more she talked, of course, she knew. <laughs> she knew. <laughs> she knew she would hook me. So um, I kind of jumped in, and uh, I wasn't really, I think, you know, um, I walked into the first meeting, and there were, there were just active, engaged, compassionate people. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, that liaison thing kind of went by the side. And then we and, uh, made her a board member. All of a sudden, <laughs> I was a, all of a sudden, I was the coordinator of the grants program. Um, and so, you know, I never look back. It's very, it's very exciting. Um, it's fun to work with uh, people who are so committed to this. And we often talk. You know, we all have busy lives, and then mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it gets to be. Um, we have to juggle schedules and such, but every person on the board, I think, is committed to this mission. Um, we currently have uh, 14 board members, and then we have committee members. And um, over the years, again, we sort of fine-tuned the way that we work. We've had um, facilitators to help us. We've had brainstorming sessions, that kind of thing, to sort of figure out what the best structure was for us. Um, so we have strong board member, strong board member structure, and then we have strong committee structure mm -hmm. um, that feeds into the board and you know keeps our activities and everything going. Now, how often do you do you meet to bring all of your ideas as and grant processes together? As a board, we meet every other month unless right. otherwise needed, mm -hmm. and then within that time, and, and and that's the restructuring has been really helpful with a small group of people. Um, we have all the committees report in mm -hmm. and sort of talk to each other in between and meet in between and then the board sort of hears those things and if there's anything that has to be brought before the large board then we have an executive board as well we have right. officers mm -hmm. um, so the the board meetings are now very efficient mm -hmm. and their reports and tweaking anything and asking the board for any advice of anything then the committees go back and do their work now you, you've talked about restructuring and and changes what has changed or how has the organization developed and grown since its inception eight years ago? Well, um, at the beginning, uh, as I mentioned, at the beginning we really um, got, got a lot of our sort of program ideas and structure ideas from looking at other education foundations. Mm -hmm. And um, we always knew that the, as I said, we always knew that the foundation would be giving up grants. Um, but we also you know, experimented, I would say, with some needs in the community to provide um, some workshops, to provide, um, uh, you know, some kinds of programs that we, initially we had a spelling bee, now we've changed to a trivia bee, so we try to address the needs of the community. And one of the first things that Nancy actually helped with when she joined the board was we, we did focus a, uh, we did focus groups. Um, and we did a lot of work on those focus groups. We did them by ages. Mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of, um, you know, flow charts, flip charts, everything else to try to hone in on, you know, sort of what the community needed that mm -hmm. we could provide that uh, uh, wasn't being provided elsewhere. And I, I think there's been a, um, a level of understanding that we've, you know, tried to grow um, that we are, and we are, a, a private not-for-profit mm -hmm. or not um, and some people you know that that that's an understanding that you have to you know sort of teach people and also that while we focus we do provide grants to the district and to the schools in the in the district we also provide grants to as you said in your opening piece to uh, libraries to um, uh, you know uh, various organizations and that kind individuals of thing. As well. individuals as mm -hmm. um, it's just a sort of a wide wide range and when we think about education we think about education sort of in the broadest terms right not just related to right. the school district or I mean schools. and I just one other thing I would say one of our um, founders was Howard Kelly who was an educator in the community and the first um, superintendent when the district was regionalized and 
it was really interesting as a founding member, you know, when Howard sat down and we were all talking about, you know, what we were going to look like and that kind of thing. He was so, so passionate about the idea of lifelong education, mm -hmm. and this from a, a man who, you know, made his, his, his professional career in a public school education. Right. So sometimes it's difficult for civic organizations to get their volunteers. How do you keep your members interested? Um, I it's would not hard. Yeah, <laughs> it's not. I mean, if you're if you're like you, you know, point of fact. I mean, Nancy is a, still a teacher in the district, but you know, my kids are you know 28 and 31, mm -hmm. and um, and you know, if you if you believe in. Uh, sort of the importance of education and the importance of volunteering and the importance of, you know, supporting your community, mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we all sort of share that vision. So it's not really that, that hard. And I think part of the restructuring is that we, um, we try people out in the committees. We don't try them right. out, but we, you know, they work on a committee right. and they have a specific task and then they see the organization and right. they meet the people and, um, and then um, we invite them sometimes to you know to be on the board. So mm -hmm. we have grown from I think we had ten members. We have fourteen active mm -hmm. members now, and our committees tend to be six, seven, eight, mm -hmm. nine people. Mm -hmm. um, and we all know different groups of people. Um, so in a lot of boards, you know, our board is very active. A lot of I know a lot of people who who are on boards, and often you're on you're on a board, but your name is on there, and you don't. You know, you're not necessarily immersed in mm -hmm. the in the day-to-day -day workings, but all of the board members are very very involved, active, very right. involved in in right. in um, involved almost sometimes on a weekly basis if a project is coming up. And one of the things um, I wanted to add is we uh, we set aside time uh, for brainstorming. Mm -hmm. We're always trying to every grow, mm -hmm. and every year we have either a retreat or a, or a meeting or a large part of a meeting. Mm -hmm. And people come with their ideas, and uh, so we always wanted. So the talk of the towns mm -hmm. was one of those ideas, and we talked about it. It bubbled up. We we put it on the shelf, uh, and then we talked to go, and we and we finally said, "Listen, we've been talking about this for a year. It's still here. Right. Let's let's move on it." So we made a little subcommittee, mm -hmm. and that's been a really exciting um, Initiative. event yeah, um, I, that's had twice. sold out. You can't even, you have to stand in room only crowds. That's wonderful. Yeah. Right. That's great. So one of the groups CVEF helped fund is the Coggenshaw Community Band, or what started out as the Coggenshaw New Horizons Band. It certainly changed over the past few years. Let's take a look back at a report we did just after the group came together for the first time back in 2013. <laughs> band for adults who either never played or played in school and want to get back into it. Most of us uh, played musical instruments in high school. For me that was 50 some years ago. So we just picked it up and from June and came on with it. I, I just like music. I, I've been singing in church choirs for years and uh, played a tuba in high school and I had an old tuba so I just dug it out and brought it in. So you just dusted it off and jumped right in. Yeah, right. We got uh, uh, support from New Horizons organization. It's an international organization. Now you'll find these bands everywhere from Durham to Indonesia. For a group of people from the community who came together for the first time that only practiced for not a very long time, they they really pulled off a great concert. It was really fun. And that was our Coggenchog Valley Education Foundation New Horizons Band. And the band has gone through some changes. Mm -hmm. So Betsy, why don't you tell us about some of the changes that the band has gone through since that started a few years ago? Actually, it's a, it's a, it's a great story because when they applied um, for the grant, it, the New Horizons Band is actually a national sort of program for adult bands people who um, 
are over the age of 50 and want to get involved in a band again. Um, and so when Tim, right, Tim? Tim Fisher. When Tim Fisher <coughs> applied for the grant, he based it on that um, model. And what he found was after a year, he was having a hard time recruiting um, enough people over the age of 50. And so he asked us if he could, you know, pr keep pursuing it. Um, he dropped the age limit to basically an, ad an adult band. Um, and it is now the Cogginshog uh, adult, adult band. Adult band. Yes, band. right. Um, not doesn't have any affiliation with New Horizons anymore. Self-sustaining, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's been it's been great. They give two concerts a year, mm -hmm. one at Christmas and one in the spring. Um, it's uh, you know I went to the Christmas concert, um, and it just provides such a great opportunity for people who played an instrument maybe in high school and college and haven't mm -hmm. picked it up or. Uh, I know one of our board members is actually plays the uh, clarinet in the band and it's her clarinet from fifth grade or something like that that <laughs> she's great. held on to which by the way was a long time ago um, <laughs> and now she plays it in this band um, we sure. have uh, you know they have more people than they can uh, uh, you know gather in and uh, it, it's a great uh, success story I think and I think there's a there's a huge uh, social component to it yeah. as well so a lot of people have met people we're always looking for things that um, put the two towns together mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of people have met different people and after they practice sometimes they go out and, and have a social time together and um, they're having a blast That's and, which is great and they also interestingly they uh, practice uh, they rehearse and perform actually out of um, the independent day school. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's a private school in the community, but again, um, it provides us with really great space for that kind yeah, of, for that kind of thing. It is there. a beautiful mm -hmm. theater. Yes. And we've also made a, because of that maybe, we've made a connection with the headmaster there, headmistress, mm -hmm. the right. head of the school. Head of school. Head of yes. school. <laughs> yeah. Um, Who is one of so our committee members. Which is another, yeah, which is yeah. a resource we've developed from, from that experience. That's right. great. So um, we, you also have another group that is also interested in music, except this group is interested in a more classical side of things, Kalnia Gardens, and mm -hmm. they're also a grant recipient, and they provide a sustainable venue for classical music. Correct. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about what they offer yeah. for programs? So this is, um, this is a house in Middlefield, um, Tim Gassler. Uh, his daughter Leah Gassler um, was actually approached by one of our committee, one of our board, board members, members, because she played at the Durham Library, mm -hmm. and she uh, and her fellow musicians have degrees in classical music, um, and so the, the the house is a beautiful farmhouse that's been renovated uh, as like a music space, mm -hmm. an art space, mm -hmm. and um, they've uh, for the past couple years they've put on three, I think, different concerts, um, and there w there's four of them usually, uh, maybe five. There's a piano, there's a cello, a violin, a viola, and the, the space is set up with folding chairs and wine and cheese, and um, it's, you can apply online, you can buy a ticket at the door, it's sold out again, once again, and it's just, it's a beautiful space, and the music is, I can't even describe it. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's beautiful. Um, the, the grant also, uh, um, the Calmia Gardens has plans for the future and we're trying to sort of maybe in the future work with them to, to have an art space and to have, um, um, there's a farm there mm -hmm. and there's gardens and then there's vegetables um, and the idea of farm to table um, fundraisers or events mm -hmm. or renting the space uh, and, and kind of a cultural arts center mm -hmm. almost right. with a homey atmosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are having our um, semi-annual event there for the first time this year oh, uh, in May that we can talk about in a few minutes. Sure. Yeah. Right. And um, the event that you're talking about that you are going to have in the beautiful gardens? Well, first we should say that the, the chamber music series, um, they actually do are like the third, fourth weekend in May. Mm -hmm. um, and um, our event, we, we, are, we have a one ma major fundraiser each year. We do an annual appeal where we appeal to the community mm -hmm. on an individual basis with our newsletter and things. But then we also have um, an event each year. One year we have a trivia bee, and then the following year we have a silent auction. Mm -hmm. So um, this year our silent auction 
is going to be for um, planters and we're going to have a garden shop too and we're actually holding it at Calmia Gardens on May 6th. Um, and it really is um, a lovely uh, spot to have that kind of event and um, you know it's sort of uh, we have helped support them they are providing us this opportunity right. we sort of look at it as a win-win sort of situation and they are also um, one of their audiences for the uh, concerts is the members of the Middletown Garden Club and so we hope to bring in and expose our um, our event to some more people who might not otherwise know it's about it. It's a great outlet for yes, everybody. Yes, it mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. So another uh, award that you give, and we talked about Howard in the beginning being the superintendent of schools and one of the founding members, is the Howard Kelly Award. Um, why don't you tell us how that award came about? Well, I think, you know, um, you know Howard was uh, just, you know, someone who everybody knew in the community. And um, one of the things that we, and here's again how we've evolved. When we, were, when we first started eight years ago, um, Merrill um, and the board members wanted to uh, give out some kind of community service award, some kind of community service award that supported you know, education efforts. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we did have that kind of award, but when Howard passed away, um, I think we really felt that we wanted to honor him okay. and you know by honoring him it's so it's so easy to know the the uh, attributes that mm -hmm. you're you're looking for and and trying to honor um, his wife uh, his widow Renee is very involved in in the when we have the reception and and, uh, and um, so what we do is we look to the community um, for nominations mm -hmm. for somebody in the community who has sort of Howard's spirit of, um, it doesn't have to be being a teacher or an educator, although it has been, mm -hmm. but supporting volunteerism in the community and mm -hmm. uh, sort of recognizing, you know, what a great and special community that we have. Uh, and I think we've given out uh, four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've given it out four times. We have the reception in December, sort of our holiday party at Indian Springs at Indian Springs and the and the greatest thing about this reception is that the previous winners always come mm -hmm. and bring their family mm -hmm. and um, they see it as you know uh, just something that they're so proud of it's a nice family event it is mm -hmm. it is it's great so talk of the towns it's a relatively new uh, series mm -hmm. that you are sponsoring and how did the series come about um, I think that was one of our brainstorm ideas, and we started talking about how we all loved TED Talks. And then we started, we started realizing that there were so many people in our community uh, that were interesting uh, and that we could tap to, to speak. So we kind of set up a format. We wanted it to be like a TED Talk. Mm -hmm. So there are four speakers, uh, 10 minutes each. Um, and then um, they, they, the requirement is they have to bring something visual while they speak. Um, and then there's a break in between. So when we have it at Indian Springs, um, it's a great venue there. Mm -hmm. And there's a little intermission. Everybody, again, it's another community, so bringing community people together. And then we sit back down and have two other talks. And then uh, we usually have to ask people to leave when the venue closes <laughs> because they're asking questions right. of the speakers and they're talking about everything. And offering um, ideas for future speakers. And offering ideas right. for future speakers. So um, a couple examples, uh, we had a gentleman talk uh, about his trip to China and he was there during the Tenement Square mm -hmm. um, uprising and actually witnessed it. Um, we had two Egyptologists who uh, came in their garb and um, showed slides of all of their unearthings. Mm -hmm. um, we had an ER doctor um, who talked about how the new concept in medicine is that patients should be more in charge of their own health and that um, how doctors actually diagnose and he showed us kind of a pyramid how they actually the process of elimination but they, they mostly want to listen to patients and sometimes patients don't speak up. Uh, we had a gentleman who followed uh, volcanoes all around the world and showed some pictures of that. So really interesting people. And we talked and about whether we diverse. need to f go to Yale and Wesley and, and we mm -hmm. thought let's start 
with our community and we try to make it very diverse so yep. that's right. uh, the committee meets and we say you know we've had authors we've had you know right. so we mm -hmm. try to have it um, have a diverse group of speakers. Right. That's nice that you can draw on the experiences and the talent it's amazing. of the community members. And we members. haven't it's had to go out time. of Durham or Middlefield and we have, there's no end there's to it. There's a waiting list. Right. <laughs> oh, that's there's good. Well, no really, it. yeah. Um, so it's great. It's amazing yeah. what's in your own backyard sometimes. Right. Exactly. That's so. terrific. Um, so how do you get the word out about your programs and your grants? Well, I, I'm going to let, uh, we're coming into our grant cycle, yes. yep. um, and so I really think it's, you know, important yep. to, you know, to sort of talk about mm -hmm. that because really that's what, that's what we're, that's our next big thing is to yep. give out our grants for this year. So our grant cycle is, uh, we're in it, the deadline is May uh, 2nd, Monday, May 2nd. Um, we do lots of things. Um, we, um, we use the school system actually, and we send out emails to our parent list and our faculty list. Uh, we mail flyers to businesses, local businesses and organizations. Mm -hmm. We put flyers around town. Uh, we have a press release that went into Patch and Town Times. Um, one year, and I was just telling Betsy, I think we're going to try this to, again, we sat at uh, Park on Main mm -hmm. and just talked to people. Um, we have some big, some big roadside signs that we purchased last year, and we're going to put those up a like couple years board before signs. the mm -hmm. date. Uh, a lot of word of mouth, mm -hmm. also. So, what um, kind of programs are you looking for to give your grants? So, we we look for we have a whole way that we evaluate. The committee reads all the grants, um, and then we come together uh, with a kind of a checklist. Um, so we're looking for things that fill in a perceived need in the community, um, something that's innovative and different, um, something that uh, reaches a large group of people. We love it if it could be multi-generational. Um, and then the grant process is the application is um, very user-friendly. Uh, so what we, we look at the overview of the grant, what's, what's the project, um, what are the objectives, uh, an important thing is how are you going to measure? How are you going to do? How are you going to know that you achieved your 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 objectives? Mm -hmm. um, and then the budget. Um, and sometimes you know we've been known to to fund parts of a of a grant mm -hmm. because we don't have limitless funds at this point. Mm -hmm. And then um, the the recipient can find some other funds, and usually that happens. Mm -hmm. And one of the big things we look for also is sustainability, so that after we fund your project for a few years. Can you sustain yourself? If and that's are, what you want to do. And there are right. things like that, like the Go Far program that was an originally a grant that, that are become part of the community. And this mm -hmm. band I, I foresee mm -hmm. is going to be that. Mm -hmm. I think Calmeo Gardens is going to be that. The composting at the Durham Fair mm -hmm. is going to be that. Um, and we feel very proud of the fact that we, we, we were the people who started that. You know, we made it possible for them to start that great idea, right. and then it's, it continues the transition group. So there's a lot of things that are now embedded as part of the community. People might not know mm -hmm. that originally they asked us for funds and right. we provided them. So. Well, thank you for giving mm -hmm. our community members an opportunity to realize their talents and giving them a way to be able to afford their dreams. So Nancy and Betsy, thank you very much for being here on Destination Durham today. Thank you for asking us. Thank you us. for having us. Yes very much. Thank you. That's all we have time for, for tonight. Thank you for joining us and be sure to check us out on Facebook for any updates or for new reports. I'm Alicia Fonash-Willette. Have a great night and see you around town. Mm -hmm.